morning, everybody. I see some uh, old faces, and then I see a lot of new faces this morning. Um, but before we do anything else, uh, if you have your Bibles, could you open up to Psalm 51? And what we're going to do is, as I pray this morning for... When you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, my, in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your sins from my sins. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Let's come to before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come before you, Lord, and we desire to be broken and to have a broken, contrite heart before you, Lord God. For you will not reject us, Lord, when we come before you. For you are good, Lord, you are loving, and you are faithful, Lord, to do everything that you have promised us in your word. Lord, I know that in some people in this room, Father, are struggling with sins and things that are holding them back, hindering their walk with you, Lord. So I pray that this would be a psalm that helps to free them, Father, and to restore that joy in their hearts, Lord. And for others, I pray that, Lord, that you would open their lips, Father, that others may come to know you, Father, through the change, the transformation that you have done that you, the things that you will do in their lives. So Lord, with the meditations, with the words of my heart, uh, with my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Lord, this morning, be acceptable before you. Amen. So for this last month, we've been uh, studying different kinds of psalms. Um, and we're talking about the real struggles of different people throughout human history, throughout Israel. For example, um, a couple of weeks ago, Peter talked about Psalm 42, and we, we learned in that through hard times how to hope in God when things are difficult. And even before that, when George talked about, for me, it really hit, hit me, when George talked about how to actually question and doubt and how to 
face doubts and, and struggles in your walk, when you have questions about God, these aren't kind of the uh, feel-good uh, sermons and feel-good topics that you sometimes hear at church. These are real people with real struggles and real feelings. And this morning, we come to a psalm where we learn about how a real believer, in all of his messed upness, genuinely repents and comes before God to confess sins. I got to tell you, um, this psalm, every single time I read it, messes me up. There's, there's no easy way of preaching this psalm. This psalm is not meant to draw a crowd. Let's just say that. This psalm is not meant to uh, make you know, me popular. This, but this psalm is absolutely critical. It's crucial to your and my walk with God and in our relationship with God. There are things that are holding us back. There are things that are hindering us from drawing closer to him. And this psalm helps us to overcome that. Maybe for some of you this morning, um, you cannot think of a particular sin that you're struggling with in your, uh, in your life. But if we can be honest with ourselves, um, all of us, either before or now or in the future, will struggle with sins that hold us back from God. Recovery groups are not just for people who we think, who we judge as being um, messed up. Because before God, all of us are messed up. All of us are broken. And so this morning, I wish for each of us to come before God humble and to really examine your hearts and to really look deep within and, and let's really deal with the things that are really there. For others of us this morning, I wonder, maybe you have a sin or a struggle or a stronghold, something that has been beating you up for years and things that you can't just get out of your mind and it's just, um, you try to deal with it, you know, you, you say sorry before God and then you try to do certain habits, you read a book, you uh, listen to a, a sermon, you talk to someone, but it's constantly coming back, constantly haunting you. Ever, anyone have one of those? I know it's hard to admit, but if we have those kinds of sins and those struggles and, and the thing is that when you constantly deal with that, and you, sometimes you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know what I mean? Sometimes you just get sick and tired of saying the same thing, doing the same thing, and seeing no transformation, and then coming to church, where you're supposed to look like, act like someone that you don't necessarily feel like you are. So in the midst of all these things, what do we do? How do we change? How do we come before God for forgiveness but also for transformation and renewal. This psalm, Psalm 51, is the fourth of seven, something called penitential psalm. Some of you might have heard this psalm before. Uh, some of you might call it the repentance psalm. And so confession and repentance, it really is the focus of this psalm. And it, through this, what we, what we got here is we have a personal experience of David. And from the personal experience of David, really looking into him sharing his confession with us, we are learning about the timeless truth of how we need to come before God. In the description of the psalm, it says, A psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Now try reading this psalm without reading that part. Sometimes, like, not all the time, and there are certain descriptions in the psalm that doesn't necessarily uh, do that much for you, per se, but this, this uh, description is key. It's really important for us in terms of understanding what Dave is actually talking about. This, uh, in this passage, David is broken, he is sorry, and he's humbly, humbly coming before God, asking for forgiveness, because much like us, David has done a couple of things that he regrets. And David has tried in the past to hide all the sins that he has committed. I don't know about you, but I don't really like all my dirty laundry being out in the open for everyone to see. I mean, I'm not just, not, apart from this, just dirty laundry. But, you know, when, we, when our house, when our home is uh, 
in a, a mess, and it's dirty. All of us, before we like to, like we went over to uh, Calvin's yesterday. We like it to be neat, nice looking, set up. We like it to look a certain way. We like to be presentable. You know what I mean? Like the Facebook you is probably the best you. You know, because it's on public media, you, everyone's looking at it, so you put the best pictures. If that p- picture makes you look fat, you're going to delete it off your timeline or something, you know. We, w- we have this idea, we want to present ourselves a certain way. And David, for a while, might have done that. He tried to hide his sins. He tried to hide the things that would make him look bad. But here, what we see is everything's out in the open. There are certain sins in your life where you feel like if you really know even at church, amongst believers, you, you can't seem to tell other people because you're like, if you really know what I did in the past, and the sins that I've committed, if you really knew me, then you wouldn't love me. You wouldn't accept me. Now imagine being David. David is a powerful public figure. He's the king of Israel. And imagine his, his most shameful sin is all over the headline news. Imagine if, I'm not necessarily talking about President Obama, but imagine if the president of our country got caught committing adultery, raping a woman, impregnating her, and then murdering her husband to get away with it. Think about what that would do on the, on the internet. But what happens here is that it says Nathan came to David and called him out straight up. His secrets are out. His worst nightmare is coming true. And so here we see a man whose deepest and darkest secrets were exposed for all the world to see. Now we got to know a couple things about David before we, we, we keep going. David is called a man after God's own heart. Now I don't know about you, but that's a pretty impressive title. Like, I would love to be called that. I'm not that, but I would love to be called that. A man after God's own heart. Now, David, along with that, he's a stud. He's a, he's a warrior, okay? He's the kind of guy that every man uh, watches. Wa- he, they, we watch epic wars. We love it. We love the battlefield. We love uh, the guy who wins. And he's that. He's a stud. He kills lions and bears with uh, sticks. You know, he kills Goliath, a nine-foot, fully decked-out giant, trained, um, and he knocks him out with a stone and chops his head off. That's just epic. And the thing is, and this is probably one of the reasons why a lot of single guys, especially in here, would be envious of him, the ladies loved him. It's, in fact, there's one time where King Saul gets really irked uh, because as he's coming back from a battle, he comes back to Israel and the ladies come out and the women are all, uh, you know, they're happy, they're, uh, uh, they're celebrating the victory and they say King Saul has killed thousands, but uh, David has killed tens of thousands. I don't know if you like, I, I watched Nutty Professor. What I imagine is like, Hercules, Hercules, you know that part? Like, I imagine something like, like that, and like, he's a hunk. But he's not, he's not just a warrior. He's not just, uh, you know, athletically fit, ladies. He's also, he knows how to express his feelings. That's like the, the perfect man. Some of you single ladies are like, that's what I'm looking for. That's going to be a qualification on my list. Uh, he's not a meathead. He's not a lunk, for those of you who go to Planet Fitness. He's not a lunk. David uh, could beat up a person for you and then sing to you afterwards and write about it. A beautiful ballad, a romantic ballad. He's a talented musician. In fact, it says, if you read Samuel, it says that David uh, used to play for the king. He was so good that Saul would ask David to come and play because it, it would calm him down. Now, for a while, this David looked like he could do no wrong, especially when he was uh, rejected, especially when things were difficult and he was in the wilderness season of his life, uh, especially when King Saul was going after him and you read stories of uh, King Saul trying to kill him and David going, no, how can I kill you? I'm going to do the right thing. That was David at some point in his life. 
But now David is king. He's successful. His season has come. He has houses. He has uh, women. He has the riches. He has, uh, his home is bigger than uh, the homes at MTV Cribs. I don't know who watches that anymore, but he, he's got everything. Now, some of us might think that when you make it, everything's going to be okay. When you get that thing that you're dreaming for, that you've been longing for, that everything's going to work out. But what we're going to see here in this passage and what others of us know is that when you make it is actually when you better watch it. When you make it, you better start watching what's, what's actually happening in your own hearts. So turn with me, if you will, to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now it says, are you, are you turned there? Everyone good? I'm going to go. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when the kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remains at Jerusalem. Now that's interesting. The, the author, the writer, points out the fact that this happened in the spring when kings, like David, should be out there going to the battle, but instead David, instead of him going out personally, which is what he had previously always done, he was always the guy that people trusted because he's out in the front lines fighting, you know, he's the general, right? And, but this time it's different. Instead of going out, he sends Joab and his servants instead. Now, what was David doing instead of going out? He was chilling out in the palace. I don't know about you, but when you know that you should be doing something and you're not doing it, like you know that you know that you should be doing something. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, I'm, I'm at home and uh, with my wife, I, I know that I know that I should be cleaning my house and wa you know, washing the dishes, you know, loving her, you know what I mean? And instead, I'm playing NBA 2K14, which is by, by far my favorite game. But anyways, uh, and I'm doing that instead. That always leads to no good. Always. But anyways, let's keep going. So verse 2. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Now, when I was a youth, I learned something at church called bouncing your eyes. Have anybody ever heard of that? Uh, I'm lost. I'm like by myself here. All right. Uh, bouncing your eyes. So that's what I learned to do. So if I see a beautiful woman, say, in the gym, it's just like, uh, bam. You know what I mean? Like as, at the instant I see it, I'm turning around. David, that's not what he does here. He sees a beautiful woman and he notices she's beautiful to behold. That just means she's hot. Okay? And... David, for all of the strengths that he had, he had one huge weakness, his Achilles heel, women. By this time, scholars uh, tell us that he had about six wives. I don't know. You know, I'm trying my best with one wife to be a good husband, and he has six wives, okay? So David is looking out over the balcony. He wakes up one, you know, he wakes up, he's chilling out, you know, and he's like, sprawled out. Then he goes up to the balcony. He's looking over uh, everything that he owns, everything that he has conquered, everything that's under him. And he sees a beautiful woman bathing. And by the way, her name happens to be Bathsheba. I don't know why it's named that way, but anyways. So when he, so when he should walk away, he takes a peek. When he should be just going back to his room and doing what he should be doing, he takes a peek, but that peek later turns into a stare. And that stare starts... He starts wanting her, and he's got to have her. So let's keep going. So verse 3, So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, who happens to be one of his mighty men, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. 
for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Uh Uh-oh. He knew that she was married. And he knew that she was married to uh, one of his men, his loyal men, mighty warriors, and she just happens to be uh, the daughter of one of his mightiest warriors. He knew that he knew, but common sense would say, don't mess around with that, don't touch that, don't go there. But he wanted it. He, wa- he needed to have her. So what does he do? David's the king. He can do whatever he wants, right? He uses his kingly authority, which God gave him, not to do good, not to serve, but to manipulate, to use for his own desires. And some people might water this down, but for me, when I read it, when I've been studying this, I would say even as far as to, to say David uses his kingly authority. She, he, he knows that she can't say no to him. And so it's almost like he's, he rapes Bathsheba. Uriah's wife. And he, the worst thing happens, he impregnates her. Now, some of you all know this story and you've heard it growing up. And, but the sin doesn't stop there, does it? David tries to cover his sin immediately by calling for Uriah, the husband of the wife. Then he first flatters Uriah, going, uh, doing small talk. Hey, how you doing? How's, how's the war going? How's the people? You know, everything good? You know, how's Joab, your commander? Uh, and then he tells him to go home and sleep with his wife and even sends food. Like, here's food for your, your date. I literally, it says that in the passage, okay? Um, but Uriah is a man of integrity and he refuses to go. He's like, how can my comrades, uh, my brother in arms, be out there in the trenches and me um, going home to enjoy my wife? That used to be what David was like. And when that doesn't work, David even gets Uriah drunk, intoxicates him to then go to your wife. But even drunk, Uriah still does the right thing. So finally, and this is the most messed up part, you know, he has Uriah take with him a letter to Joab that says, kill the messenger, basically. So in Uriah's pocket, as he is just done chilling out, you know, I I just got to hang out with King David. You know, this is really cool. He goes uh, back to Joab, and little does he know that this David who flatters him be careful of people who flatter you, by the way. Uh, he actually has plans for him to get executed. And that's what he does. David murders Uriah and then takes Bathsheba, his wife, as his own so that he could cover up the fact that the baby that Bathsheba already has was actually his. He's the daddy. One sin on top of another, on top of another. And that's how sin goes, guys. One sin, you say one lie, and it keeps going and going and going because you don't want to tell the person that you messed up in the the very beginning. So you keep letting it happen. James 1, you don't have to turn there. James 1, 15 says, Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. That's the nature of sin. So some time passes. In verse 27, it says, Bathsheba bore him a son. Now, I have a son, but I'm not like a medical expert. But I'll just say this. Ladies, some of you who just had babies or are pregnant, maybe you know this better. But so David uh, conceives and he murders uh, Uriah in the beginning. And then now, at this point, The baby is born. Uh, I believe that's about like 200 days plus has passed. So during the the entire time, those 200 days, David is living in sin. He is far from God and his heart is hard. He's living a lie. 
but he's still doing his churchy thing and, you know, being the king, doing his role, everything. But the Lord, in his mercy, sends Nathan the prophet to confront David about his sin. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be Nathan and telling the king who can kill you, uh, hey, by the way, you sinned and you murdered and I'm, you know, I'm telling you to your face. Like, I wouldn't want to be that guy, just saying. Um, so Nathan tells him a story. And he tells him a story about a rich man uh, who, although having a lot of sheep and a lot of uh, having much, he takes the poor man's uh, precious lamb and kills that lamb to feed uh, his guest instead. Now this story trips up David. Despite how messed up he is, despite how great his own sin is, he gets mad and he starts say, uh, yelling out, as sure as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Now, that's bizarre to me. But it's, it's true. Us, we sometimes, no matter how messed up we are, we're still clear enough to see everyone else's sin and say, uh, you are the sinner. Doesn't matter. Don't look at me. Don't look at how messed up I am. I still know you're the sinner and you're messed up. That's what David was doing here. And Nathan takes David's own condemnation of that man and he tells him, you are that man. That was you. Now, I got to tell you, when you repent and come before God, when you confess your sins, God will forgive you, and you can um, reestablish that relationship with God. But your sins have consequences. And God is a God of justice who will give your sins the consequences that line up with the crime. And so this is what happens in this passage. It says here that the consequences of David's sin and what God says to David through Nathan is this, that for the violence that David committed, there will be a violence in his own home. The sword will never leave your home. And what happens later is that his David's son, especially Absalom, starts killing other members of the family. For the adultery, the sexual sin that David committed, your neighbor will shame you by sleeping with your wives. Sexual shame. And that's what happens when his son Absalom takes David's concubines and sleeps with him for all the world to see. Your son. What David has done secretly, his son, uh, what David has done secretly, God will do publicly. Publicly, Everyone in Israel knew, will find out about David's shame and what he did. Especially when he's running away from Absalom. And there's a couple of guys there going, that's your fault. That was you. You should die. And lastly, for the death that David deserves as a result, the baby will die. And that's, the, that's a tough one to swallow. The baby will die. Imagine hearing that. Finally, David, in all the hardness of heart that he has, finally he breaks. After so many days of living a lie, he finally comes true. He comes forward. He... But amazingly, Nathan tells David that the Lord has put away your sin and you shall not surely die. David is forgiven. But as I said, there are consequences. Now, broken and repentant before God, there are four ways that David responds to the guilt of sin in Psalm 51. So let's, if you can tar- turn back to Psalm 51, let's, let's dive in. David starts, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. The first point, and you guys don't have your notes today, but the first point um, is a genuinely repentant believer places his only hope of forgiveness, not on himself, but on the loving kindness and mercy of God. A genuine believer, a believer that is really repentant, places his only hope 
on the loving kindness and mercy of God. Look at the passage here. David starts the psalm by pleading for mercy, but he doesn't give God a list. And, and I would say David has a pretty impressive resume, especially compared to myself. Um, and he doesn't list off everything that he did right. He doesn't say, remember the time, God, when I did this for you? Remember the time that, I, that time I did it right? I'll get it right next time. He doesn't do that. He, he also doesn't compare himself and his sin to someone else's sin. He's, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. You see that guy over there? That's the guy that you should be judging. David doesn't do that. Instead, he doesn't give any self-defense. He says, have mercy according to, according to your loving kindness and the multitude of your tender mercies. I like that. Before he starts, he's even talking about his sins and going into it and asking God to forgive him on those things. He first starts out by reflecting on the character of God. Specifically, his loving kindness and his mercy. Now, this loving kindness is a word that kind of sounds strange to us, so I'm going to unpack that a little bit. The word loving kindness usually refers to the word chesed. The word chesed is talking about a loyal love, a covenant love. Uh, let's see if we can make this plain. God is faithful, not according to what you say for him to do, but according to what he said he will do, according to the covenant he made. God keeps his promises. God is faithful in love because that's who he said he is. That's how he promised. That's what he promised about himself. And David also bases it on God's abundant mercy. David knew how to appeal to the mercy of God based on who God is and according to who God revealed himself to be. So how did David know that? Exodus 34, 5 through 6, it says, I'll, I'll read it for you. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And he, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Growing up, David heard that. David knew that about God, about the character of God, based on what God said about himself. This passage is God saying, this is who I am. David knew that according to what God said about himself, that in some mysterious way, that although God is fully just and punishes the guilty, God prepared a, a, a way, a only hope for people like David who have sinned to come before God to be forgiven. That God had prepared a way for sinners like himself to be forgiven from wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Verse 2, let's continue. He continues his request for forgiveness by asking the Lord to uh, one, blot out his transgressions, wash him thoroughly from iniquity, and cleanse him from sin. The three are really working, they're, they're saying the similar thing, aren't, isn't it? Right? The, the word blot, wash, and cleanse, there are three imperatives that really, uh, scholars say it might be referring to something about the cleansing ritual in the temple. And then David says, the three nouns, transgressions, iniquity, and sin, are really three ways of calling sin, sin. So why does David do that? Possibly it's because David intended to em emphasize how far-reaching and comprehensive David's sin actually is. Meaning that th he's saying it three different ways, but he's saying, look, this is how messed up I am. This is how messed up my sin was. And I understand that. I know that about myself. Guys, um, let's, let's be real. We are standing on the other side of the cross. David didn't know about Jesus, right? He knew that God had mysteriously planned a way for him to be saved. But we stand on the other side of the cross, and we know that mystery is Jesus. We know that the mystery revealed is Jesus Christ and the gospel. We know something that David doesn't know. 
And yet, a lot of times, and I'll say this about, honestly about myself, a lot of times I depend on my own work, my own good works, my own actions. I go to church, I serve, I do this thing, I do that thing. I try to uh, make myself presentable before God. I try to get everything straight, and then I try to come before God and say, God, I'm sorry. I depend on myself. It's not, have mercy upon me, O God, according to you and who you are and what you have promised, but according to, look at all the things that I've done. Some of you guys, that's the reason why you're so burned out and tired. That's the reason why you don't see a change and transformation in your life. And you put all that weight of change and forgiveness on your own shoulders. And it doesn't work like that. We're standing before a holy God, a perfect God. Even on our best day, it's not enough. So come before the Lord. Ask for his mercy based on what he's promised in his word, the truth of who he said he is, for he loves you. And he's promised himself to forgive those who come before him. Uh, Second point. A genuinely repentant believer acknowledges the full responsibility for his sins against God and God's right to judge. Let's look at verse verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is uh, always before me. I acknowledge my transgressions. Before you can get changed, I don't know if some of you have gone through these 12 step programs or whatever, but before you can get changed, you have to first acknowledge that you're messed up. That you have to first acknowledge your sins before God. I don't, I don't know about you, but for me, I don't like to do that. You tell me, uh, some of you guys say, you come up to me, I don't do this, okay? But have mercy. But uh, after church, you come up to me and say, Dave, you're messed up. You did this, this, and this. And uh, yeah, you need to apologize. Uh, most likely, in my heart, my first instinct is to defend myself or to say, you know what, compared to so-and-so, uh, that, that ain't so bad. Or uh, minimize what I did, right? But that's not what David does here. He says, I acknowledge my sins, God, before you. He doesn't minimize that. He doesn't say, and I, I always say this to my, to my wife, I'm sorry, Lynn, but, and then go off. He doesn't do that. I'm sorry, period. That's just a lesson for all of us, <laughs> especially for husbands. I'm sorry, period. <laughs> no, no but, all right? And my sin is always before me. You got one of those hidden in your closet? Do you have a sin in your life? You close your eyes. You can't go to sleep because you remember it. You wake up and you still remember it. Uh, you know, for me sometimes, when I'm preaching in front of you guys and I feel the devil going, hey, remember Dave, that sin, that thing that you did a couple years ago back yet and you are standing before them preaching? What are you doing, Dave? You have one of those? A thing that you regret? And it constantly comes back. You can't turn it off. You forgive and forget. No, you, it, it seems to be really hard to forget. It just keeps coming back over and over and over again. Let's keep going. Verse 4. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Against you and you only, God, have I sinned. What? Is David serious? Is David saying that he did nothing wrong to anybody else? He didn't wrong Bathsheba by raping her? He didn't wrong Uriah by murdering him? Imagine if you were Bathsheba's dad. Imagine if you were Uriah's mom. And the killer, the one responsible says, I did nothing wrong to you. Is that what David means? No, that's not what David means. 2 Samuel 12, 9, Nathan tells David, when he's calling him out, he says, why do you despise the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Now, what does this mean? This means that sin 
by definition, it's not saying that David did not do wrong to these people. It's saying that sin, by definition, by the very nature of sin, is first and foremost against God. Sin is sin because it's breaking who God is and what he said to do. When David wronged Bathsheba, he didn't just wrong Bathsheba, he wronged God. That's what that means. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Therefore, God, I mean, therefore, David first acknowledges his sin and says, God, I wronged you first and foremost because before I even mess with uh, trying to figure out how to fix my relationship with all the people that I've wronged, I need to first come before you and say, I messed up and I need to first get your forgiveness. You first go to God and clear that up before he goes and talks to others. He's saying here, um, God's, David is acknowledging his sin and also God's right to judge him. He's saying, God, I deserve to be condemned. And you condemning me would be just. Have you ever owned your sin like that before? I am so wrong. I messed up so badly, God. And whatever you do, even if it's the worst, I have nothing to say. You're right. Even if you condemn me to hell, you're right. David continues, Behold, in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin my mother conceived me. This is not David trying to minimize what he did. He's not saying, I was just born this way, therefore, this is what I do. He was trying to say, from the very essence, from all these different things, from the very beginning, God, completely, I am a sinner. It's been there, and it's growing, and, I, and it's going to keep growing, God, unless you stop it. He's actually intensifying the nature of his sinfulness in his life. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. David is pointing to the fact that God wants us to have integrity. Integrity. God's righteousness in us to be consistent from the inside out. Not just what you say, not just what you do on the outside, but what's actually inside of you. And I got to tell you, this is probably the hardest thing for me. This whole week I struggled with this. Am I going to come before you today and preach but have integrity? Am I going to be broken and contrite hearted before God? Before I tell you that's what you need to be. Don't ever believe a preacher who doesn't do what he preaches who doesn't submit under the word of God. And I can tell you, if someone knows all the hidden things that I have in my heart, uh, that's my wife, because at home, if, I'm, if my attitude is stinking up the joint, she'll tell me, uh, yeah. So remember the thing that you preached that uh, a couple weeks ago? Yeah, uh, what, where is that? You know? Integrity. Guys, who are you when no one's looking who are you in the secret places, the hidden places of your lives, in your thoughts, in your room, when no one else is at home? What are the thoughts that run through your mind? What are the things that you do? How do you spend your time? Is it reflective of God's righteousness, of who, his holiness, and what he's called you to be as his children? Integrity. Third point, a genuinely repentant believer runs to God to wash away sins. Verses 7 through 9. Let's read that. 
Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Man. David, you can tell, says, purge me with hyssop. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. David feels dirty. Sin has a way of making you feel unclean. Make me hear joy and gladness and that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face. The bones that you have broken may rejoice. Sin is not just, doesn't just make you feel dirty, but here in this case, for David, sin is a weight, a burden, a crushing weight on his heart. And he's suffocating. He's looking to God. God, would you just alleviate me from this? And lastly, he says, "Turn, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Hide your face. Shame. David feels shame. He, he feels the shame of everything that he's done in his relationship with God. Shame. So he's asking the Lord to wash him of the filth in his life to turn his face away from the shame and to cast off that crushing weight off his back. Now it's interesting, um, in the beginning it says, uh, for, I don't know, uh, when I'm reading the Bible, sometimes there are certain words or certain ideas that I just don't get. Like why would you say the word hyssop, for example, in the beginning of that? What is hyssop, right? And so hyssop was a leafy plant, a kind of a shrub that Old Testament priests used to sprinkle blood so you li- they would literally sprinkle blood all, say your house was considered unclean, they would sprinkle blood all over it and to declare it clean. That's what, hy- that's what hyssop was. That's what it was used for. So he, David is asking, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. God, you declare me clean. Why? Because you know what? There are certain sins, certain things in your life that no matter if the pastor says, uh, God's forgiven you, you have the gospel. There's certain things that you're going, God, it uh, doesn't matter what no pastor says. I need you to say I'm clean. That's what David's saying. No p- human priest can say I'm clean, that I'm forgiven. God, I need your forgiveness. I need you to justify me. I need you to declare me clean. As Christians, we are washed by the blood of Jesus. But some of you, and, and me as well, we struggle with shame. Some of us have that yoke on our back that's constantly there and we're trying to carry the weight of our lives. And Jesus promises us, cast off your yoke for my yoke is easy. My, bur- your burdens, my burdens is light. We have honor, not shame before God. And for me, just Asian, you guys see it. Being from Asian heritage, <laughs> some of you guys are Asian, know what I'm talking about. Um, the shame is what I struggle with the most. But the gospel allows us to have honor before God, not shame. His blood covering, Jesus' blood covering us, God declaring us clean and pure. Now some people may wonder if the blood, so if, if I'm already forgiven by Jesus and it's once and done, it's permanent, then why should we keep asking God to forgive our sins? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever struggled with that? In 1 John 1, 1.9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The apostle John here is, is writing to uh, young believers, my little children. If you have been a Christian for a while, you know that although we are positionally, because of the blood of Jesus, we're positionally right before God, but functionally we're a mess. It doesn't take long as a Christian for us to figure that out. So it is absolutely vital for us, for our souls to repent and confess our sins before God as David does. This is why this psalm is so important. And in confessing, we are drawing near to God and we're opening ourselves up and going, God, would you come in? We can't change ourselves, God, but would you come and change me? Would you clean me? It's not an excuse. 
Our forgiveness in Christ is not an excuse for us to not come before the Lord. One commentary puts it, the cross is not the reason we don't ask God for forgiveness. The cross is the basis of our confidence that the answer will be yes. It's not an excuse. It is our confidence that we can come before the Lord, ask him for forgiveness, and that his answer will be yes. Last point. A genuinely repentant believer is passionately committed to a life-transforming spiritual renewal that is only possible by drawing near to the Spirit of God. Man, I really wish you had your notes. <laughs> Sorry, my points are really long, I noticed. Mere forgiveness, you just being forgiven, you know it, but you get to the point where it's not enough. Have you ever felt that way? You get this sick cycle of sin where you sin and then you say sorry. You sin and then you say sorry. Constantly, in, day in and day out. Um, and for me, what I usually do is I sin and then I feel bad about it. And so I run be, uh, away from God for like three, four days until I feel better. And then I come before God and say, I'm, God, I'm sorry, I messed up. And so we don't, just, we don't just mess up, but we also lose time to be drawing near to God because we're running away from him. David here doesn't just want to be forgiven. He wants to be transformed, renewed by God. David asks for five things. David's passionately committed to change and he asks for five things. One, verse 10, a clean and steadfast heart. A clean and steadfast heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David doesn't want to sin. David doesn't want to sin, but as long as sin looks so good, seems so appealing, he's going to keep going back to it. He's asking God, God, would you give me a new heart? a heart that's sensitive to the things that you want, the heart that delights in you, a heart that delights in doing the things that you want me to do? Would you give me new taste buds, a new appetite? Two, he asked for the continuing presence of the Spirit of God. Verse 11. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Now, as we know as Christians, we can't lose the Holy Spirit because of what Christ did. David has seen his predecessor Saul lose the Holy Spirit because this is before Christ. But I don't think that David is just worried about losing his kingship. David understands that without the Holy Spirit, without the very presence of the Spirit of God in his life, he can't change. Without God, without what he does in our lives, we can't change. It's not by our human effort. Three, David asked for restoration of joy in God's salvation. Verse, 12, uh, verse 8 and verse 12. Make me hear joy and gladness. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. David did not lose his salvation in God, but what David did lose is his joy in God. Some of you, that's your struggle. You're still saved. You still have a relationship with God. You're still forgiven. But somewhere along the way, you've lost your joy. You've lost your joy. And the thing is, why would David ask for that joy? Is the restoration of joy in your life and in mine that important? Absolutely. It is not enough for us to be just take preventative measures and keeping ourselves from sin. To try to tell, like my son, try to tell him, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. It just makes someone want to do it more. It's not enough just to say no. We need to be actively, not just preventively, but actively pursuing God, actively pursuing his joy, and actively delighting in him. When we find our satisfaction in Christ, when we find our joy in him, everything else that seemed so good to us before, so appealing, it just loses its glamour. It just loses its appeal. 
John Piper puts it this way, every sin is symptomatic of the absence of this joy. Every sin. He's saying, God, I need your joy because if I don't have your joy, I'm going to go to another woman. I know that about myself. I'm going to fall again, God. I need your joy to sustain me. Lastly, actually, this is, real quick, this is uh, the fourth point, actually. Open lips. David asked for open lips, the overflow of joy leading to praise and evangelism. Have you ever come to church and we're in the middle of worship, the worship team is going, everyone's singing, everyone, uh, I, I don't been, I've been to some charismatic churches where people are, you know, jumping and they have their hands up and everything, and everyone's singing, but maybe you just really had a bad week. Maybe some of you, you just struggle with sin the entire week, day in and day out, and you come to church, and that day, when everyone else is singing, you're, you have closed lips. You just can't sing and mean it. That's where David's at. So David asks God. Isn't that awesome? You can ask God. God, I don't want to praise you. I don't want to sing to you. I don't feel this right now, God. I'm not, I'm not digging this right now. You need to open my lips. You need to give me a song of praise. You can be that honest before him. Some of us feel like we have so blown it in our lives that our sins are so much that we cannot be used by God to make a difference, that we cannot praise him, that we cannot be used by God uh, to make an impact for Jesus in the world. But you know what? I mean, I'll just say it even last night. Last night we had a testimony and uh, s'mores time at Calvin's place. And it was so encouraging for me because we had this circle of people and we're all confessing how badly we messed up in our lives. We're all sharing our testimonies going, man, I did this, I did this, and then I was this messed up. And the result was a joy. We were celebrating. We were encouraged by one another. He's, I'm saying, I messed up. Calvin's saying, I messed up too, bro. <laughs> but well, we have the same God. I wonder, guys. Maybe in our evangelism, some of you guys want to go share the gospel with people, and you, some of you guys still use that four-point four track or whatever. Sometimes I wonder. I mean, of course we've got to present the gospel. But sometimes I wonder, would it be more effective if you went up and you shared with your friends and the people that you feel God is leading you to going, you know what, man, this is how badly I was messed up. This is what I got myself in. Confessing. Sharing your testimony, going, and this is what God saved me from. I wonder if that will be more effective, more powerful. Instead of us going, you're a sinner, you're doing this, you got to fix it. You, instead of that. To come broken and open and honest with God and with others. Lastly, a broken and contrite spirit. <clears throat> Read verse 16 and 17 with me. For you, O God, you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. These, O God, you will not despise. You will not reject in other translations. This whole psalm, Psalm 51, is really David putting verse 17, a broken and contrite spirit, coming before God in action. This verse, when you read this, if you don't remember anything else that I say today, David is modeling for you in this psalm what it looks like to come before God broken and repentant. Contrite means repentant. It says in, the, in verse 16 that God does not desire sacrifice or David would give it. He does not delight in burnt offering. Now these things, see, what you and I do coming to church, worshiping, uh, it doesn't matter. See, it doesn't matter how much you give financially. It doesn't matter how much time you spent here uh, serving. In and of themselves, those things are not bad per se. But what I'm trying to say is that that's not what God ultimately delights in. When, we are, when you are a child of God, 
the greatest thing, the, the thing that you want the most is for your father to take delight in you. Right? Before his punishment, before all these other things, you want God, the father, your father, to say, I am pleased with you. I love you. I'm so proud of you. That's what, when I die, I, when I die and come before God, that's what I want to hear. It's not even my wife going, great job, Dave, or not, uh, preaching today. I, that's not, I don't really care about that. As much. It, would, it would be nice, honey, but um, that's not what ultimately God delights in. God wants a broken and contrite spirit. He's not impressed by how many times you come to church. He's not impressed by your position in the church, even for me as a pastor. He's not impressed by that at all. What God wants and he never rejects is for you and I to come to him with a broken and contrite heart. It doesn't matter what you have done in the past. Christ has already taken his blood and declared you clean. Come before God today and he will not reject you if you come before him with this heart. And to be honest, guys, and this was so amazing to me, I realized something. You can never really get past broken and contrite spirit. There is not, it's not like I sinned and then for a month I'm really broken and I'm really humble before God. It doesn't, that's not how it works. We constantly need to fight, to battle, to struggle with our flesh to say, God, keep me humble. God, keep me broken before you. God, keep me repentant before you. Please do not let my heart go hard because I sin daily. Whether or not I know about it or I don't know about it, I mess up daily. God, I need you daily. We can never really get past broken and contrite spirit. We need his mercy every day, every morning, anew. There's never a moment in our lives where we don't need God's grace. So as we gather today and every week at Loft as a family, we come and we celebrate the Lord's communion. I don't know what God is speaking to you this morning from this passage not from my words, but from what he's revealed in his word. But I pray that you just have a really honest time before the Lord. Bro- come to him broken and contrite. Search your hearts. Look within what's going on. And when you feel ready, let's celebrate.